thank you very much for for the opportunity to give a talk here and thanks the organizers for for organizing the this nice conference uh, okay so I, i'm going to talk about uh scaling limit scaling limits of disordered system and okay i'll give a general introduction to what we're trying to do and why we are trying to take scaling limits of things and Okay, so you can do that with many, many uh, disordered systems. And I'll take one example, which is the Paul and Schrager model, uh, and talk about some joint work with my uh, former PhD student, uh, Alexandre Legrand, who is now in, in Lyon. Okay, so let, let me first uh, start with some general introduction, and let me talk about disorder relevance for disordered systems. Okay, so, so I'll give a, a general introduction uh, because I'm not sure uh, everyone here is familiar with, the, with what a disordered system here is. Um, okay, so uh, let me give you a recipe for constructing a disordered system. Okay, so the recipe is simple. Uh, first, take a system, take a, let, let me call that a model, that you know pretty well. Uh, okay, let, let me say from statistical mechanics. Uh, you can think about the simplest model of all, the simple random walk. Uh, you can think about the easing model, you can think about well, the Polo and Schrager model. Okay, you, you just take a system. Uh, and then you, uh, okay, so it's a perfect system, you know everything about it. And what you do then, you sprinkle some disorder on it. Okay, so the idea is just add some perturbation to your system. And when I, when I say sprinkle, I mean like really a little bit. Okay, so you can think about for, for the simple random walk, you can, uh, you can place that in a random environment with the, like say, small uh, variance. Uh, or for the Paul and Schrager model, it's a model for DNA, so you can think about like adding some, uh, like, uh, some uh, disorder to it, uh, putting some randomness in, uh, in, the, in the interactions. The easing model, you can like remove some edges at random in your, in your graph. Uh, or put some random external field. Okay, so you have many, many ways of, of looking at uh, adding disorder. And uh, so the last step is, well, to ask questions. And okay, so I already I can ask some question and, and maybe the, the first task is to ask the, the good question. Uh, and the good question is a question that you can answer. A, a better question is a question that you cannot answer and you're trying to, 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 find, uh, to find the solution. Uh, okay, so, so what are the questions? The main questions is, um, okay, the main question is, is the perturbed system very different from the original one? Okay, so the question you ask is somehow the stability of your system under the sprinkling of some disorder. Okay, and so what you want to do is to compare the perturbed system with the original system. And that, that's the question of disorder relevance. Okay, and that, that's an important question from the physics of uh, disordered system. And it, okay, so it dates back to a long time ago. I, don't even know how far it, it goes back. Uh, but there are some predictions from physicists. But first, let me tell you that, uh, like some terminology, if uh, for any epsilon positive, the epsilon perturbed system is different okay, from the original one. And when I mean epsilon, 
I mean it's the strength of the disorder. Okay, so epsilon is the strength you put in your sprinkling of disorder. And the idea is that you'll find epsilon small. Okay, and so the, 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 the first part is that if you sprinkle some disorder and how weak the disorder is, like can be arbitrarily weak, uh, and if the uh, perturbed system is different from the original one, you say that this order is relevant. Okay, and if there is some uh, epsilon uh, zero positive such that for any small epsilon, the epsilon perturbed system is, let's say, similar then you said that this order is irrelevant. <coughs> okay, so that's, that's uh, a general question that physicists have been uh, interested in. And let me just tell you that there has been some prediction in the physics literature by Harris, uh, I think, in the 70s. So I'm going to mess up with the date, but let's say 73, uh, which predicts only looking at your original model, whether, whether you're in the first category or the second category. Okay, so there is a general prediction and has been a, a task by uh, mathematicians and, and physicists to try to make this prediction rigorous in, in many examples. Okay, and the Paul and Chagra model was one of the examples where people have been able to, to answer that question completely. Okay, and Okay, so that's that's a general question. So first, yeah. how, how do you define the, the property that the system is different? Yes, that's a good question. <laughs> so it's well, you can think about that as system per system, or usually the, the what I didn't say in the recipe is take a model with the phase transition and see whether the phase transition has the same characteristic, for instance, the same critical exponents. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, so this is very vague for now, and uh, it's on purpose that it's vague. And I'll, I'll, I'll give the example of the Parnasraga model to tell you how it works in, in a practical example. Other questions? Yeah, would that be for any kind of disorder? Mm. And it's also the way you sprinkle the disorder, it will make it depend on, okay, Okay, so the way you sprinkle disorder may have an effect on the disorder relevance. But by the predictions of Harris, it has not much of an effect, right? Whether it's relevant or not. Okay, and once it's relevant, okay, so when it's not relevant, when it's irrelevant, what you know is that your perturbed system is similar to the original one. Okay, so you know the perturbed system. It has to, if you know the original one, you know the perturbed system. But if it's relevant, then it's a very difficult question to say, okay, I know that it's different, it behaves differently, but how does it behave? And that's, that's, uh, that's an important question and it's open in, in most, most cases. Okay, and, and here what I, what I did was to uh, say I uh, fix uh, epsilon positive very small and I look at the perturbed system uh, versus the original system, but okay, so there's a, let's say, new uh, other way of seeing this disorder relevance. It's uh, through uh, taking scaling limits. Okay, so not every uh, original system you can get a scaling limit but all the systems that i uh, i told you about the simple random walk the easy model in dimension two or uh, or, or the polen chaga model you have a scaling limit of the original system and uh you can you can ask the following okay so it, again it's very vague and i'll explain to you how you can make this vague thing work in uh, in an example uh, if there is a way of taking a scaling limit, OK, 
Okay, so disordered scaling limit. Okay, meaning that, okay, so usually you have a parameter in your system, uh, for instance, the, the mesh size of your, uh, of your, uh, your graph. Uh, or, or the length of a polymer, uh, okay, and you can take epsilon uh, going to zero with the parameter of your system. So let's say epsilon, uh, epsilon n. Okay, so you have a sequence of systems, simple random walk of length n, and you can try to define the epsilon n ver perturbed version, and if you are able to take epsilon n go to zero at the correct speed, Okay. Okay. So that's that's. I'm trying to explain what taking a disordered scaling limit uh, means. So you want to take epsilon going to zero at a correct speed, and the disorder survives in the limit. Okay. So for for the example of simple random walk, you can think of okay. I take the simple random walk. I take the scaling limit. That's a Brian motion. If I look at the epsilon perturb system, I can try to take epsilon going to zero in a correct way so that I don't get in the limit of Brian motion, but something else. Okay, some disordered version of Brian motion. Okay, and if there is a way to do that, then you can say that disorder is relevant. Okay, so that's, that's another way of seeing the, the, these are the relevance that I've put here. So here you see a fixed epsilon positive, and you can say, okay, uh, if uh, this order plays a role for every epsilon positive, I should be able to take epsilon going to zero, and, and this order still play a role. Okay, so let, let me say that uh, this idea of taking a disordered system was uh, like, Taking scaling limit was obviously uh, not a new idea, but the way of presenting this uh, question of disorder relevance in the scaling limit, uh, it's uh, from Caravena, Sun, and Ziggurat. And they have a nice survey on that. Uh, I think the survey is from 2017. Okay, and okay, and if you're able to construct these scaling limits, then you know that when you have scaling limits, you can try to pull back some information on your original system. So you can hope that if you're able to do that and you understand the limiting system, then you'll get information on your original epsilon perturb system. Okay, and, and so, yeah. So the rest of the talk will be uh, about doing that in, in the Paul and Schrager model. And so the idea is to trying to uh, construct a disordered scaling limit and show some kind of universality so that you can pull back some universality on your ori original system. Are there any questions? Okay, so, so let me uh, introduce the Paul and Schrager models. Uh, and let me introduce, so there are two levels when I construct the disorder system. There is the original statistical mechanics model that I'm considering and the perturbed version. Okay, so let me start with the original, which I call homogeneous Poland Chiraga. Okay, so Poland Chiraga uh, model is, okay, so there are two two, actually, two different models. There's the, the original model, the standard. Okay, so Paul and Schrager will be PS in the following, the standard PS model. And, okay, so it dates back, uh, you can guess by, uh, it, it was invented by Poland and Schrager. Uh, and uh, it's a model from, say, biophysics for DNA. And more precisely, DNA denaturation. Okay, and okay, maybe, maybe I'll tell you that 
you might also have seen this model uh, in the literature as the pinning model. Uh, so it has actually a long history, uh, like three different models that converge into the same framework. Uh, model for uh, an interface in the easing model, or a model for pinning of a random walk uh, on a wall, uh, things like that. But I'll focus on the DNA denaturation uh, presentation. Okay, so here is the model. So you have DNA loop, well, DNA, DNA strands, and the DNA can make some loops, right? That's the denaturation phenomenon, you uh, have some DNA and when you increase temperature, you, you'll, you'll create some loops in your DNA and uh, that's when the DNA can replicate itself. Okay, so you have something like that, some loop. And in the original model, the, the loops are all symmetric. Okay, and okay, so how do you define this model? Well, first, you say that what will be important are the points of contact between the two strains of DNA. Okay, and let me tell you what would happen if there were no interaction between the two DNA strains. So, if you have no interaction, what you have to do is just describe the, the, the list of points of contact. Okay, so the points of contact will be described by a renewal process. Okay, so what I mean by renewal process is that you have L1, L2, L3, and I will denote by tau1, tau2, tau3, uh, sorry, tau0, tau1, tau2, 3, and the renewal process on the integers. So you start from 0 and the increments are IAD and valued. Okay, and that describes your DNA uh, loop configuration. Okay, so if you call li dot i minus dot i minus one, you can interpret that as the length of the ith loop in your model. Okay, so what I mean by that is that on top of this, you have this picture. Okay, sorry. Okay, so you just, okay, so the picture is getting messy, but I think you get the idea. So you have some loops and the length of the loops are IID. And common assumption in this model is that the probability that you create a loop of length li larger than L, of length equal to L, will behave like L to some power. L to the power minus one plus half. Okay, and in, in the following, I will focus on the case alpha between zero and one, because that's when you have a scaling limit. Okay, so, so that's when you have no interaction and let me go, uh, okay, let me go there. So when you add interaction, well, you just actually introduce some Gibbs measure. Okay, so you have a parameter n, which is the total length of your DNA strain, and you have a parameter h, 
Okay, so you have n an integer, h a real number, and you say you modify the law of your loop configuration of your renewal process by adding a reward h each time you have a contact between the two strings. Okay, so let me write that this way. And of course you have the partition function to normalize this to a probability measure. Okay, so what this measure does is that okay, you take uh, configuration and its energy is proportional to the number of contacts. So if H is positive, you want to uh, favor uh, having contacts, the two DNA strands. And if uh, H is negative, you want to penalize this, uh, this, uh, this contact. Okay, and this is a very famous uh, model. And there's a, there's a book by uh, Giambattista Giacomin. Okay, so there are actually two books. Uh, I don't remember when they are, uh, but I think it's 10. Uh, presents this, uh, this, uh, this model and the disordered version. And it's called the pinning model. And what can you get as a result? Okay, so let me just draw uh, uh, drawings to, to explain the results. Well, in this model, you have a phase transition when you make H vary. Okay, so you have some H critical, and if your, if your H is smaller than H critical, then what you'll see in your uh, configuration drawn from this Gibbs measure will be roughly things that look like that. You have a couple of loops, and then no loops, one, one big loop you can, you can take off. Okay, so it means that the two DNA strains are detached one from another. And when you're above the critical point, you have small loops and basically all of order one and uh, yeah, exponential tail of the loops. And at the critical point, you have a scaling limit. Right, so you can think of the scaling limit at the scaling limit of the loop configurations or just the scaling limit of the, the renewal process tau, which you normalize by n. So you have a subset of 0, 1, and this is a, a, ran this is a random set set that converges to uh, what is called alpha regenerative uh, process, uh, which is the zeros of, of a Bessel process. And if you draw the, the thing, it's multifractal and you have big loops next to small loops at all scales, etc., etc. Okay, so you have a scaling limit, but it's not a disordered scaling limit yet. Okay, that, that's the model. And another thing that you can, you can, uh, you can try to describe is all these phases a bit more precisely. So let, let me give you another result on, on this model. Uh, let me call dh the uh, density of contact, or the limiting density of contact. Okay, so this is the number of contacts between the two DNA strands. You uh, take the average under this Gibbs measure and divide by n, take the limit, that's the limiting density of contact. And what you can show is the following. So you have your critical point here, and this density of contact, okay, so it's zero before the critical point, it's positive after the critical point, and then you wonder how it jumps of zero at the critical point. And so here what you have is something very explicit. You can, you can solve this model completely and you get h minus h critical to the power one over alpha minus one. Okay, so. Okay, I'm taking the case alpha between zero and one. 
Okay? If alpha is larger than one, you actually have a jump in, in the contact density. Okay, so very well. This is one very good candidate uh, for the trying to understand the Harris criterion because Harris prediction is exactly based on, on this critical exponent of, of the original model. Okay, and so here you have the whole spectrum uh, from uh, zero to plus infinity of uh, critical exponent. So, okay. So is, is the model clear? So that's the first model. Before I go to the disordered version of that, I'll explain to you the second model, the generalized pollen Tregob model. Okay, so the idea was uh, to generalize uh, this uh, model for DNA denaturation because it was not uh, physically and biologically uh, relevant uh, to have loops that are exactly of the same size. Okay, so the idea is that when your DNA strands uh, they, they come apart, when they reattach to each other, they may mismatch, right? They, they do not form exactly symmetric loops. Okay, and so th there was a, a new model introduced by Garel and Orland in 04, and Jean-Baptista, Jacomin, and Mahatib made uh, the model, uh, 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 made the mathematical formulation of the model, and, and solved the model uh, in 2017. So what, what is the model? So again, it's for DNA strands, but the thing is here you allow to have loops of different length. Well, different and an asymmetric length, okay, so. Okay, so you have this type of configurations and okay, you want to do more or less the same type of, of model. And if you have no interaction, then it's not enough to have just one sequence of times where you have, uh, that, that describes the completely the loops. Right, so now each loop is described by two integers, the uh, integer from the above loop and the integer from the loop below. Okay, so what you want to do now is to describe the loops. Okay, so if I denote uh, li, li, okay, let, let me denote that like that. So this is the length of the ith loop. So you have the length, length of the above strand and the length of the uh, strand below. And you assume that they are IID uh, with, the, okay, so with the same distribution, more or less uh, in the same way as, as before. Okay, and so what, uh, how does that translate, uh, how does that modify the renewal process? Uh, now what you have is a renewal process on N2. Okay, so I'm trying to write that a bit differently. Uh, it's a renewal process on N2, and what it means is it means that the tau i minus tau i minus one, the i id N2 valued. Okay, so before I could represent the renewal process on the line, now I need to represent the renewal process on the quarter plane, and I put points that are going up in the uh, uh, northeast direction. Okay, so you, you can think about taking jumps from one point to the other. Okay, and so this trajectory of the renewal process describes the trajectory of loops. Okay, 
And similarly as before, you will make some assumption on the priority of having a loop of a given shape. And you assume that the priority actually depends only on the uh, total length of the loop. Okay, so all loops of same total length have the same probability. And then the, the, yeah, the, how the loop is split into two subloops, right, the strand above, the strand below, is uniform uh, along the loop. Okay, so let me give you the results. So now I can. Okay, so this is the PS model, the standard one. And this is the generalized one. Gener Okay, so the idea is exactly the same, and I write that exactly in the same way. Okay, so except here what I do is I modify the law of the uh, loop configuration, which is a, a b-dimensional uh, process. Okay, so I keep the same notation except for tau, but it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, and, and here what I have to sum is over the number of loops. And so the number of loops is exactly the number of points I have in my renewal process up to NN. Okay, so what I can do is I can check every point in the square and verify whether it's a point of contact or not. Okay, and, and you can also, maybe something I can tell you is that if you have a point IJ that is visited by your renewal process, then it means that the i-th uh, monomer of the strand above is touching the j-th monomer on the strand below. Okay, so let me check. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm taking some time. But I will arrive at scaling limits soon. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's your new model. So you see it's not very much different than, than the previous one but it's based on a bivariate renewal process and it makes things comp more complicated, but you can actually more or less solve this model completely. Again, okay, so let me give you the results by Jacobin and, and Khatib. Again, you have some critical points. Uh, below the critical point, you have some number of loops and then no contacts anymore between the two strands. After the critical point, you have loops of finite length. And at the critical point, you have something uh, also uh, uh, um, self-similar. And the difference here is that, okay, so here I, I draw some symmetric loops. So meaning that the next loop is attached exactly diametrically opposed to, uh, to the previous loop. And here this is not true anymore. What I do is actually have loops of different length and the next loop is attached. You, you choose a point uniformly at random on the previous loop and you attach a loop like that. Okay, so you have some uh, random object. And I draw loops because I, it's easier to draw uh, the loop configuration than the, uh, than the renewal configuration. But what it means, it means that if you take a renewal process at the critical point, bivariate renewal process at the critical point, you can see that as a subset of uh, the square. And in the scaling limit, this subset converges to a random subset of the unit square, which has uh, these uh, scaling invariance properties. Okay, 
So these are the two models and you also have the same critical behavior. So, yes, the models are the models clear? And okay, so now the, what you want to add disorder into, into the picture and you start saying that it will change a bit when, when you have uh, asymmetric loops. But let me tell you what how Harris predictions give. Okay, okay. Uh, not telling you how it gets the prediction, but the prediction is that if alpha is uh, smaller than one half, then this order is irrelevant. And when alpha is larger than one half, then this order is relevant. Okay, so that's the predi prediction we're trying to, to prove. Okay, so now let me go to how do you define the disordered version, okay? As I told you, there are different ways of sprinkling disorder in, into these systems. And okay, maybe, maybe I, I can insist that here you see that the, the reward you get each time you get a contact is the same throughout the, the DNS trends. And so you don't see the fact that you have different uh, pairs of bases. Okay, so what you want to do is actually assign some random variables to each base here, right? You have, let me call that zeta i from the strand uh, above and zeta i from the strand below. And you can do that in both, in both settings, right? And uh, okay, so the disordered version They are uh, based on these two uh, sequences of random variables. So let me write that. So we have uh, two sequences of random variables. And I'll take them independent one from the other. Okay, so that's an assumption which is not uh, really true in the biological setting because what you should have is that this bottom sequence is the complementary of the above sequence. But let's simplify things a little bit and say, okay, these two sequences are independent. ID independent. And, okay, so the uh, Paul and Schrager model is the following. The standard Paul and Schrager model, uh, you define a measure which is epsilon perturbed, right? So it's called the disordered Paul and Schrager model. And what you say is that instead of giving a reward H each time you have a contact, you put a reward H plus epsilon times a function of the two strands that meet, the two, yeah, the two monomers that meet. Right, normalized by the uh, partition functions. Okay, so here it's very natural. Uh, in the first model, only, okay, so if you have monomer i, which means the, the monomer i of, uh, of the bottom strand, they have an interaction and you can model the interaction by a function of what happens on the top and what happens in the bottom. Okay, and if I go to the generalized disordered Poland Schrager model, the natural thing to do is, okay, it's the exact same thing. And 
except that here you have a function of the two random variables that meet, right? So you have a function of zeta i from the top strand and zeta j from the bottom strand. Okay, so here you see uh, a bit of a, dif of a difference. Okay, and now I can give you the, the results. Okay, and, and the question is, okay, do you have also, since they have the same critical behavior, do, do they have also the same condition for Harris uh, prediction? And uh, is this uh, weird interaction uh, having some role? Uh, so let me use the left one. Okay, so results in the in the standard Paul and Traga model is that the Harris prediction is okay. Okay, so I will not write the names of all the people who contributed to that, uh, but okay, so the main names are uh, Fabio Toninelli, Jean-Baptiste Giacomin, Hubert Lacoin, Nico Ziguras, uh, Ken Alexander, uh, Thierry also contrib contributed to, to that picture. And okay, I'm surely forgetting some people. And this was the Harris prediction from the original point of view, meaning that if epsilon, okay, so what, what it means is that if alpha smaller than one half, it means that the critical behavior is like the original, meaning that uh, that you have the exponent one over alpha minus one. And if alpha larger than one half, then the critical behavior is different. Meaning that the exponent, we just have a bound on it, and the exponent should be larger than one. Uh, with no condition on the function f, uh, yeah, no condition on the function f. Here, I've yeah, I've hidden some uh, something. Okay, so one thing that you want to do is actually normalize the system. So let me write that here. And what you want to do is you, this normalization is you want that the expectation of this exponential is one. Okay, so you want finite exponential moments on, on, the, on this, uh, this uh, thing. And uh, let me think. Uh, yes, I think that's, that's all you need. Maybe you need that to be centered as well. But it's not that important, I guess. Okay, and, and this is a good remark. This is universal. in the sense that it does not depend on uh, f or the specifics of the law uh, zeta. So this is the result for the, for the Harris prediction, and, and you can have the same result for the scaling limits. Okay, so let, let me tell you the scaling limits. Okay, so let, let me focus on the, on, the, on the partition function at the critical point of epsilon equals zero. And I want to put some epsilon n going to zero so, so that something interesting is happening. 
Okay, and so what you have is that this converges to uh, to one for any epsilon n going to zero if alpha is smaller than one half, and it converges to some random variable which depends on some limiting uh, randomness. Let me call that xi. Uh, if alpha is larger than one half, and you need to take epsilon n in a specific way. Mm, so let me think. I think that's, that's it. OK, so here you see that when this order is not relevant, whenever you take epsilon n going to 0, you get some trivial limit of the partition function. And when alpha is larger than 1 half, you are able to find some non-trivial uh, scaling limit. OK, and I'll take two minutes <laughs> to do the same with the Paul and Schrager model. And so for the generalized Paul and Schrager model, what you get is more or less the same. OK, so let me say same if alpha smaller than 1 half, so irrelevant. In both, uh, in both uh, the original Harris prediction and in the scaling limit. But if alpha is larger than one half, then here it depends on the function f and the law of theta i, theta j. Right, and maybe I can give you a result. You can actually classify the distributions of this order. Okay, in two classes. Uh, yeah. About your result, is it uh, Zn, is it the partition function or the partition function over the partition function without noise, which mm. converges to one? Uh, okay, I, I've put myself at the critical point of the original model. Yeah, you, you could, you could normalize that by its expectation, if you want. What, what I did here is that actually I normalized it here so that uh, this term is of mean 1. Uh, okay, and so, and so the result is that you can classify the distribution of these orders and uh, you have something indexed by the integer all plus infinity. And, and the result is that if you look at this partition function, okay, so the same thing as before, uh, this converges in distribution to some non-trivial random variable. If uh, if uh, if your R, your class, your, the, the disorder class you are in is not plus infinity and to 1 if the disorder class is plus infinity. And in, in the first case, what you have to take is epsilon n to be n to the power minus the same one as before, but to the power r. OK, so let, let me conclude with uh, some comments on this, on this uh, theorem is that, OK, so here what you get is that you have some semi-universality result, meaning that the limit that you obtain is always the same, right? The, the limiting disorder that you get here is always the same, but the scaling you have to take depends on the disorder, right? So that's some feature that I've never seen before. And you can also have cases where disorder stops uh, being relevant if your class of disorder is somehow degenerate. And so we have examples where uh, uh, where r equal plus infinity, r equal 1, 2, 4, 8, and 
the only examples we have are powers of two, so maybe, I don't know, there's something there, but okay, and I think I'm short on time now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, unfortunately, since we are going a little bit uh, late, I, I suggest we save questions for uh, the lunch break and move uh, straight away to the, the next speaker. So th yeah. thanks again.